Okay, hi everyone, back for another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. Happy to answer all kinds of questions here. Um, looks like we still have a few from uh, last time left over. We have one from Anders here. What is dark matter? Well, let's see. When we look out into the universe, we see lots of stars that we see uh, producing light and so on. Question is, is there other matter out in the universe that exists but that isn't producing light, that's dark? And how could we tell if it was there? So the way we can tell if other things are there is by looking at the, the gravitational effects that they have. So gravity makes things uh, is, a, is a force that pulls things together. So for example, gravity is what causes the Earth to go to stay in orbit around the sun. It causes our galaxy to stay together to the 100 billion stars that are in our galaxy to, to have them hang together and just go around in this slow spiral, uh, in this slow rotation that they, that they undergo, uh, but, but hang together. Gravity is what makes them hang together. So the question then is, can we tell from the amount of gravity that we see, can we tell how much stuff is there? Gravity, the force of gravity is, depends on mass, depends on the total mass of stuff. And so can we tell what the total mass of the stuff that's keeping the stars going around our galaxy is? And then when we look at that total mass, if we compare that with the number of stars that we see, how do those compare? Okay, so there's been this problem in astronomy for, oh, probably four decades, maybe, maybe a little bit more than that, that when you look at the rotation of galaxies, there seems to be more mass that's holding in the things on the outsides of the galaxy than we can account for by just looking at the stars in the galaxy. And uh, so that so that, that sort of other stuff that seems to have a gravitational effect, but that doesn't seem to be showing up as stars we can see that are producing light is called dark matter. Question is, what is dark matter? Uh, first question is, is it really there? Um, one thing that looked like it might be true for quite a while is that maybe we got something wrong about the way that the force of gravity works. But there are some examples where, for example, we see galaxies colliding, going through each other, where it seems like there's a thing that got left over that's dark matter, that's producing a gravitational effect, but that isn't, um, that, that isn't something that has stars associated with it. So what kinds of things could dark matter be? Well, maybe it could just be additional gas that's hanging out between stars and, and just not lit up. Maybe it could be little tiny black holes. Maybe it could be some other, some kind of particle, some kind of matter that isn't like uh, ordinary protons and neutrons and electrons that make up our ordinary atoms. We don't know for sure. Uh, there are lots of different experiments that people try to do to see what dark matter could possibly be. And there's evidence and counter evidence against various kinds of things. What seems to be the case is that whatever dark matter is, it seems like it's not interacting much with ordinary matter. Because if it was, then we would likely see, you know, if it was little tiny black holes, then maybe we'd see little places where there are ordinary matter that is somehow interacting with that black hole, those kinds of things. It seems like dark matter is something that doesn't interact much at all. And so there are a bunch of experiments that get done where people are trying to look for, oh, maybe dark matter is going through even deep in the earth it's kind of going through some detector that's under two miles of rock or something. It's still getting through there. Or maybe dark matter can be seen in this place. Maybe it can be seen in that place. Maybe dark matter is something like a, um, uh, it's, it's some kind of, of a new kind of particle that has a mass. If it doesn't have a mass, well, could have a gravitational effect uh, because of its energy, but, but doesn't really, doesn't have the kind of gravitational effect that it looks like dark matter has. Um, so it probably has a mass, but we don't know what its mass is. And uh, uh, that's sort of the challenge is to figure it out. Now, for example, in, in our recent theory of physics, there is some suggestion about what dark matter could be um, uh, because the theory kind of suggests 
that there can be lots of different kinds of particles like electrons and muons and tor leptons and so on. We know about, oh, around um, 20 different kinds of, of particles that are currently thought to be elementary, the quarks, the, the, uh, the things like photons and Z bosons and, and so on. We know about 20 of these kinds of things. Um, and uh, this theory suggests that there probably are a bunch more and particularly ones that have masses very small compared to the masses of things like electrons that we see today. And so one possibility is that those very low mass particles, I call them oligons, because they're oligos in Greek means few, and uh, they're particles that have a very small number of sort of atoms of space in them. And so these oligons would be a candidate for what dark matter might be. Um, but we don't know whether that's really what's, what's, what's happening right now. Uh, quite possibly the dark matter that we, that exists in the universe is dark matter that got created in the very beginning moments of the universe during the big bang that happened 14 billion years ago that started our universe and started the expansion of the universe. Um, that was a time when sort of any kind of stuff that could be produced would be produced because in the big bang things were, the universe was sort of infinitely hot and that means that particles of all kinds were getting produced um, in, in uh, substantial numbers, among them whatever dark matter might be. And the dark matter could have been produced and interact with things in the extreme heat of the very early universe, but ever since then, it's been not interacting with things. Uh, so uh, the, um, the, the question of... of um, and so, so some things get left over from the very beginning of the universe, for example, the cosmic microwave background, if you look in any direction in the sky, um, you'll see uh, the, the, the sort of the photons that were coming to us from, from the very early moments of the universe, well, from about uh, 10,000 years after the beginning of the universe, 100,000 years after the beginning of the universe, um, are, uh, 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 that, that, are, that are the sort of leftovers of the sort of heat of the Big Bang, same with neutrinos, and same probably with dark matter. So that's the, that's the current state of, of dark matter. And there's some interesting kinds of physics that people are doing to try and detect the presence of dark matter and to try and see when there's things where it's just, you just don't see anything there. You see some uh, effect from energy conservation, momentum conservation, or sometimes gravitational effects, but you don't see any other thing there. And that would be what one might call dark matter. Now it's, it's always suspicious in science you know, if you say, well, what fraction of the matter in the universe is dark matter? Well, it's about 90%. And that's always, it's always suspicious when, when one comes up with conclusions like that. It's like saying, you know, 90% of the brain is unused, 90% of the genome is unused. Mostly these kinds of science statements end up not being true in the end, um, that actually there is some, uh, that there's, there is some real thing that's there. Um, and we just didn't know how to look for it. There's another thing called dark energy, which is a little different from dark matter. Um, dark energy is a, is a weirder thing. It's almost, it's, it's kind of like a negative mass kind of matter that is potentially leading to the acceleration of expansion of the universe. And it's a slightly more uh, controversial kind of thing. Um, also has a, a potential source in, in our models of, of physics. All right, uh, let's see. Um, got a bunch of questions here. There's a question here, which I'm afraid I don't know the answer to. Uh, oh, maybe I do know the answer to this. Question is, why is the sun's corona hotter than its core? Um, okay, I will attempt this one. See, this is where it's very unfair because I'm, I'm, if I was like allowed to use the web and things, but I'm not allowing myself to do that because otherwise this isn't a good conversation. So I'm, I'm doing all of this kind of cold. Um, the temperature of the center of the sun, I think is 10 million degrees centigrade. The temperature of the of the luminous part of the exterior of the sun is only about 6,000 degrees. But the corona, which is sort of the area around the sun is, is, uh, is hotter. I don't actually know the temperature. It's always a little bit tricky to define the temperature of a sufficiently rarefied kind of gas because normally what is temperature? You know, when we say this block of, of metal is at this temperature, this air is at this temperature, what we mean is we're looking at all those little molecules in the thing, the block of metal, the air, whatever, and all those molecules are running around and those molecules have a certain average energy. 
They have kinetic energy associated with the motion that, that they have running around. And temperature is simply defined as the, uh, in terms of the average kinetic energy. Um, it's, there's a constant called Boltzmann's constant after a chap called Ludwig Boltzmann who lived in the late 1800s. Um, and he was the person who kind of uh, uh, worked on, on, on making the connection between the microscopic uh, properties of matter and notion of heat and temperature and so on. And so that constant K, it's usually uh, is, is named after him. And, and basically whenever there's a, a, a thing in a material that can move around in a certain direction, there's a half KT of, of average kinetic energy where T is the temperature that is associated with that thing at that temperature. So for example, a thing that can move around in three dimensions, there's three halves KT of average energy average kinetic energy associated with that thing at temperature T. And uh, so, so in, in the case of the, the, when there's a sort of rarefied gas that is what is the corona of the sun, um, I, I don't, um, I think that the heating of that is associated with, so, so, so normally when you have a, uh, just some object out in the world and you say uh, it's, it's hot, whatever. How did it get its heat? How did that energy that's making all those molecules run around come to it? Well, there are several mechanisms for things to get heat. One is conduction. Just you have a big, let's say you have a block of metal here and you have another block of metal and the uh, block of metal you just added, the second one is much hotter than the first block of metal. Well, you can conduct heat from one block of metal to the other. What that means is that the interface between those two blocks of metal, there are little metal atoms that are running around at very high speed and they hit metal atoms in the other uh, block of metal that are going more slowly and they impart some of their momentum to the other metal atoms. And so those start moving faster and gradually after every, all these atoms have run into each other and the thing has come to equilibrium, you will have taken the heat from this one side and you will have spread it equally across all the parts of this metal object. And that's that process of, of, of spreading heat by just having a sort of physical contact between the materials. And um, that's the process of conducting heat, conduction. That's one, one way in which heat gets transferred to things. Another way in which heat gets transferred is through radiation. So what that means is uh, you can, for example, light from the sun can hit something and those photons that are coming from the sun, they have a certain energy. And just like the, uh, the other atoms can hit atoms and, and, and give them energy. So those photons from the light from the sun can hit an atom and give it some energy. And therefore you can increase the temperature because you're increasing the average energy because there's, there's energy from the light that is being imparted, that are being put into the energy of the individual atoms. And that's some, um, uh, that's increasing temperature that way. And so the kind of radiation that can produce heat um, is, well, uh, pretty much any radiation, um, but uh, among electromagnetic radiation, um, not only visible light, but also, for example, infrared radiation. Um, infrared is, is what is typically associated with sort of radiant heat. It's, it's, it's the typical uh, frequency of photons that is given off by things that we heat up to maybe a thousand degrees centigrade or 500 degrees centigrade or whatever. The thing that causes heating elements on a, a, an oven or something like that to be, um, uh, to glow um, red. We're seeing just the visible light part of that, but most of the photons are infrared photons that our eyes don't register, but those are still photons that are, uh, that, that have energy associated with them and they are, what will heat up, a, let's say a block of metal or something, when those photons, those infrared photons hit the metal, they will kind of kick the atoms to go faster and that's what heats up the block of metal. So that's the second kind of way in which heat is transferred is radiation. Now that kind of radiative heating, photons are one way to get things hot. Another is if, you, if you've broken off an electron, you've broken off a proton and you're just accelerating that proton, and it's something that happens, uh, the solar wind, for example, is from the sun is, is an example of a place where, where electrons and, and photons uh, and protons rather um, are accelerated by magnetic fields in the sun and they stream outwards from, from the sun. Um, and that's another 
a kind of different form of radiation, and that form of radiation can heat things up too. And I think that's what's happening in the solar corona is that um, it's being heated by uh, the the energy associated with um, um, uh, uh, with these particles that have been made to get to this to the speed that they get to by magnetic fields, by being accelerated by magnetic fields, rather than by just being heated up by standard, uh, as a standard uh, question of, of, of the temperature of the thing. Uh, just to, to round that out, there's a third kind of way that you can uh, uh, transfer heat to things, and that's convection. Um, and convection is something that happens when, when something is in a gas, and you say um, uh, convection is uh, that there are um, atoms in the gas, molecules in the gas that get heated up, but those, those molecules actually move around. So you might have hot air, a block of hot air here, and hot air has a lower density than cold air, so hot air tends to rise. And so if we looked in this room, we'd see these little plumes of hot air going up, cold air coming down. That's the process of convection. That is the transfer of heat because you actually take these hot molecules, these molecules are running around quickly, and you're physically moving them by this sort of stream of air is moving them around. Um, and that's able to transfer heat because the hot stuff is moving to somewhere where it can then transfer its heat to something else. And so that's, that's convective heating is when, you're, when you heat up air and then that air is physically moving somewhere else to heat something up that it comes in contact with. And um, in general, you know, when you, when you ask about a, a block of material or something and you say, oh, how quickly is it gonna cool down? I've got my, my cup of hot chocolate or something and I'm, I'm waiting for it to cool down. What's making it cool down? Well, the, the number one thing that's making it cool down is convective cooling. It's that there are molecules of air that um, uh, get, that, that um, are moving around in the air, they get in contact with the hot chocolate the hot chocolate heats those molecules up and then off those molecules go, taking away the heat from the hot chocolate and more molecules that are colder come in and, and they get heated up again. And so that's why when you blow on the hot chocolate, you're kind of getting more molecules to move past the hot chocolate to get heated up by it um, and, uh, um, that, uh, and, and that it's cooling it down. So in fact, there's a, there's a thing called Newton's law of cooling. It's named after Isaac Newton. Um, which says that the rate at which something decreases its temperature is proportional to the difference of temperature between the thing and the, the outside environment. When you, that's what happens when you have so-called free convection, when you just have the thing and it's just in still air and the heat of, the, of, your, of your hot chocolate is causing some air right above it to get hotter. So that air has lower density, so it rises and transfers away the, the, the temperature of the heat associated with the hot chocolate, then new cold air comes in and then it gets heated up and transferred away. And Newton's law of cooling applies to that situation. If you blow on your hot chocolate, you can actually, I think you get a five fourths law where, the, where it's the temperature difference to the power five over four. Um, so it, it cools down faster if you blow on it. And that's kind of why it cools down faster if you blow on it. I mean, this, this process of convection is common all over the place. I mean, for example, inside the earth, there are convection currents that are associated with the mantle of the earth, which is the liquid core of the earth, has convection currents in it. And they're moving, it goes, they go quite slowly. It's very viscous rock, but it's, it's a molten rock in the center of the earth. Um, and uh, the convection currents in the earth are presumably what lead to the magnetic field of the earth. They are, they're moving things around and they're, they're presumably uh, like they, they, they move also charge around and they produce a magnetic field that is the magnetic field that we detect when we have a compass or something like this. Uh, the sun also has convection currents inside it. Um, there's a, a convective layer inside the sun. It's associated with stars of a certain size. Sometimes you see really bizarre effects. I mean, for example, if you have convection, uh, so, so uh, when, you, when you look at the flow of a fluid, um, if the fluid is flowing slowly, uh, you've got an object and fluid is flowing uh, around it. If, you, if it's flowing slowly, the fluid will just sort of slide around the object. And you'll see if you were to look at kind of streams of fluid, you'll see that they are sort of smooth streams of fluid flowing around the object. That's called laminar flow. Um, when the flow of fluid is faster, you'll start getting eddies, little vortices coming off behind the object. 
And when it gets even faster, you'll start getting this turbulent wake where the, where the fluid just looks kind of random, okay? In the case of, um, uh, of that, that's what happens when you just have an object and you're pushing fluid past it at a certain speed. The other thing that can happen is that this convection process can cause fluids to move. Let's say you have a, a, a pan of, of water or something and you're heating it from below. That heating from below will cause convection to occur because again, just like with air, the water that has higher temperature is uh, lower density, it will rise. The water of, 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 uh, that's colder will have higher density, it will fall. So you'll get these little convection current, convection cells going, but you'll have water going up, coming down, going up, coming down. And in the regime that's like the regime where fluid is flowing past an object and just sort of sliding past in laminar flow, there's a similar regime for, uh, for convection. And actually there's some really cool effects. Like for example, you can have this hexagonal collection of, of convection cells, where you look at the top of the fluid and you'll see these little regions, which are little uh, hexagons packed together that correspond to uh, the convection cells associated with little areas where the, where the fluid is going up, down, up, down, et cetera. Um, and the same thing is uh, it's um, uh, uh, when just like in fluid flow past uh, an object when it goes faster, eventually you get turbulent flow, the same thing happens in, um, uh, in convection. You eventually get turbulent convection um, and there's all sorts of issues about the rate of heat transfer and turbulent convection versus non-turbulent convection and so on. You can talk about how heat exchanges work, um, all sorts of things like that. But anyway, that, that's the basic story. The, the original question here had to do with the temperature of the surface of the sun versus its corona. Um, but uh, I mean, just to say a little bit more about the, how the sun works, um, uh, the sun is powered by nuclear fusion um, and uh, it's, it's powered by, the, by ramming together hydrogen nuclei, which are protons and releasing lots of energy associated with fusion. Um, the, uh, uh, it takes a long time for even a photon to get from the center of the sun to its surface. I think about 10 million years for us, our star. It's very, it's, it's, it's very slow because the photon keeps on, uh, it, it like hits something, it hits something else, it hits something else. And it takes a long time for it to, uh, after all those collisions, for it to wind its way to the surface, so to speak. Um, neutrinos uh, go from the center of the sun much more quickly. And the nuclear reactions that take place in the sun also produce these particles called neutrinos, which are particles that have uh, that don't interact much with matter. Um, they can uh, a lowish energy neutrino can go all the way through the Earth without ever interacting. Um, they're hard to detect, but the fact that they go so far without interacting means they can come even from the center of the sun, and they are like a form of radiative cooling. They can take energy from the center of the sun, and they just take it all the way out because this neutrino, which has energy, is like going all the way out of the sun. It doesn't, it doesn't do sort of the convective process like the photon would do where it's transferring energy to something uh, just by moving itself. The neutrino is just like, I'm out of here. And it, it, uh, it exits the sun and, um, uh, and then, then goes off into space. All right, that was a long um, answer to that. Let's see. Um, Uh, all right, there's a question um, here from uh, Sarsa. Um, are white holes theoretical or are they real? Um, uh, what about black holes? Uh, what happens to the light and matter that goes into a black hole? Okay, so what is a black hole? How does this all work? So black holes are all associated with gravity. So gravity is the force that causes things to just fall towards the center of the earth. They fall, fall towards masses. So gravity is what causes uh, massive objects to attraction between them. But when we're dealing with the earth, something on the earth will fall towards the center of the earth. Okay, if you drop something from a long way away from the earth and it was going faster and faster and faster and faster and faster um, and uh, there wasn't any atmosphere to slow it down or anything. Eventually it would go at about 25,000 miles an hour before it hits the earth. And the other way around, if you want to take something, if you want to fire a rocket from the earth and have it escape the gravity of the earth, 
it has to go at about 25,000 miles an hour to escape the gravity of the Earth. So what happens with a black hole is you have enough mass concentrated in a small region so that the escape velocity is effectively more than the speed of light. The speed of light is the fastest anything can go in our universe. And so that means that if the escape velocity is, is faster than the speed of light, that means anything that gets close to the black hole gets pulled into the black hole and can never, and, and it doesn't, the, the, nothing can escape from the black hole. So that's kind of the basic picture of how black holes work. Now, then things get complicated because the theory of black holes is to do with Einstein's general theory of relativity. And um, it took people 50 years to understand even that the mathematics that came from Einstein's theory actually implied this phenomenon that you could have this area of space where things would kind of fall in and not come out. Okay, now there's a lot of, I, I mean, we understand quite a bit more about this from our new theory of physics, but essentially what's happening in a, uh, th this picture of a black hole um, uh, of, of sort of, things fall in and nothing can get out because to get out, you have to be going faster than the speed of light. That's more or less a correct picture. Um, the, uh, let's see, how do I get into this? One of the tricky things is that in the mathematical theory of black holes, the thing that's significant is the so-called event horizon that is the, the, the thing, the, the point of no return. Once you fall into the event horizon, you can no longer escape again. Now, the question is, is that really produced by a collapsed star inside that's producing a lot of gravity or can the theory of gravity itself have a sort of self-sustaining event horizon like that? And it's a little tricky because in the traditional theory of gravity, the, the mathematical equations say you can have this thing that just exists in the vacuum. It's just associated with the curvature of space in the vacuum, the gravity that exists in the vacuum, and all that has to exist at the center of the black hole is one point that has sort of an infinite mass. That's a very weird thing. And the mathematics of it is similarly weird. It's a space-time singularity at the center of the black hole. That's all you need in order to get a black hole, in order to get an event horizon. Now, in actuality, in our universe, when an event horizon forms, it probably forms because you have a collapsing star and there's a lot of other crud inside the black hole other than that uh, potential space-time singularity. But you can get a black hole just from that one point space-time singularity. You can also get it by just having a lot of mass inside. But because there's an event horizon around it, you think, well, it doesn't really matter what's inside. All you see is what's going into this event horizon. Well, there's a whole big complicated story in the theory of gravity about whether there can be naked singularities, whether there could ever be a singularity in space time that doesn't have an enclosing event horizon. And it's now known that such things are possible. Um, and they, but only in rather restricted, complicated circumstances and very weak singularities. But uh, so you're kind of asking the question um, in a black hole, uh, Okay, so what happens in the center of a black hole? The space-time singularity, if, if it really has a space-time singularity, what is, it, what is that space-time singularity like? It's a very common kind of singularity for a so-called Schwarzschild black hole, a non-rotating black hole, is um, uh, um, a, uh, uh, yeah, that's a space-like singularity. And so uh, what, what does that mean? What it means is if you fall into the black hole, and you're falling, 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 and you're inside the black hole. This is kind of a weird thing to understand, but but basically, you always fall towards the space-time singularity, and every path that you might take inside this black hole leads to the space-time singularity, and you always reach the space-time singularity in finite time. It can, it, in your perception of time, it's like you only survive a certain amount of time, and then you reach the singularity. What happens at the singularity? At the singularity, time stops. Now in our models, where we're thinking about the, the progression of the universe as kind of a computational process, it's kind of like computation just stops. It's like you were a computer and the computer died and its brain just stopped. The computations in it just stopped. So it has no perception of time passing because everything in it just stopped. And that's what happens in the center of a, in a space-like singularity at the center of the most common kind of black hole. Um, and as time simply stops. 
Uh, the other thing can happen is a time-like singularity where essentially you are you are doomed to repeat things infinitely, re repeat exactly the same thing forever. Um, but the, I think the more generic case is probably that time simply stops. So the perception for anything that falls into the black hole is time just stops eventually. Um, and okay, so that's in a standard black hole, you can kind of see a movie of a black hole forming and all the stuff is falling in and eventually this event horizon forms and then you have a black hole. Okay, now you can ask yourself, uh, the standard laws of physics that determine how things work are reversible in time. So just like you might see, you know, if you could see a little movie of, of atoms colliding with each other, you could see a movie where these two atoms come in and they bounce off, but the, the reverse movie is equally valid where those two atoms come in and they bounce off the other way. When we look at things on a very large scale, we don't see that kind of reversibility. That's a whole different story of the second law of thermodynamics. Effectively what's happening is that even though we start with something that's very organized, the actual process of all these molecules hitting each other is like doing a computation that sort of encrypts what we fed in. And so we see something that looks kind of random, but, but that's not what's happening at a microscopic level in physics. In physics at a microscopic level, people th things are basically reversible. So if there's a process where things can fall in and make a black hole, you might say, well, isn't there a process where things can, where we can have the exact time reverse of that, where we make a white hole, where the thing is spewing out stuff um, uh, like uh, in, in the time reversed version of a black hole. Well, yes, you can have that. According to the equations of, of gravity theory, you can have that. Now the question is, can you actually form a white hole in practice in our universe? Well, that's a whole different story. And the answer is probably not. You can no more form a white hole than you can make something where you have, you know, if you break an egg, the egg will be ill and, or you shatter a piece of glass, the glass will all be in pieces and that's something you can see happen, but you don't see the glass spontaneously forming itself from all those shattered pieces into a nice organized piece of glass. That's the phenomenon of, of the second law of thermodynamics, law of entropy increase. That's what tells you that doesn't happen. Almost certainly there's a direct analog of that that says that white holes don't spontaneously form in our universe. So a black hole of things sort of coming together, that's kind of like, uh, that's, that's like standard thermodynamics running sort of things forwards. A white hole will be kind of like the reverse of that. And it probably doesn't happen in our universe. Now there are things which could cause white holes to exist. So for example, in our theory of physics, um, the fact that the universe, the universe is more or less three dimensional, has space that's three dimensional. I can move, you know, forwards, backwards, left, right, up, down. That's the three dimensions of space. In principle, space could have six dimensions or it could even have 2.7 dimensions or whatever. In our theory of physics, the dimension of space can actually vary with position. So there might be parts of the universe that effectively have slightly different dimensional space. We haven't seen that yet, um, I just actually was inventing a possible way to do experiments to be able to see things like that. Um, but in any case, the, uh, so one of the things that could happen, imagine there was what I'm calling a space tunnel, which is basically a, a lump of space that has more dimensions than three. Well, it turns out that in that case, what you would see is basically one, one end of that space tunnel would be a black hole. The other end would look like a white hole. It would be pulling in matter at one end and spewing stuff out at the other end. Now, if you ask what happens to the matter that goes into a black hole, what is the fate of stuff that goes into a black hole? Well, there are a lot of gravitational forces in there which grind things up, but it's like, do you actually get rid of this matter or what, what happens to it? Well, at first it seemed like everything just fell into a black hole and then it would stick there and, and never come out. Then, uh, well, uh, various people, Jacob Beckenstein, Stephen Hawking, other people uh, kind of figured out that there would be radiation from things like black holes, where not only is, um, is there, this was in the early 1970s, this was figured out that uh, quantum mechanics would imply that there should exist, would suggest at least that there should exist uh, sort of radiation, things that come out of black holes, as well as everything falling into black holes. More or less the reason for that is in quantum mechanics, in a sense, there's a certain amount of uncertainty in everything. And so among other things, there's sort of uncertainty about where particles are, and there can be uncertainty about, oh, if there was this pair of particles that got produced, did one of them, is, are they both on one side of the event horizon? Did one of them go on one side of the event horizon? One of them go on the other side of the event horizon? That presence of uncertainty will lead there to be particles 
that sort of end up sort of randomly outside the event horizon and able to to go off and not not get pulled into the not not to just get sort of ingested into the black hole. So it's been sort of a mystery uh, how the ideas of quantum mechanics relate to the ideas of the formation of black holes. It's a thing called the black hole information paradox that you can have sort of uh, information about uh, about matter going into a black hole, but then it never comes out again. That seemed quite mysterious and there are slowly starting to be a few possible solutions. In our theory of physics, there's a very clear solution to this, this paradox. Um, it's a little complicated to explain. Uh, I mean, I'll say the words that, that go around it. There's an event horizon, a so-called causal event horizon. There's also what we call an entanglement horizon, which is a different thing. The entanglement horizon is the thing that kind of limits the propagation of quantum information. And the point is that the entanglement horizon can be outside of the event horizon. So it can be the case that there are things that are trapped. There's sort of matter that we don't, we're not, we're not, uh, we can't detect because of this various features of this entanglement horizon. And there's also this event horizon beyond which we really, really can't see what's going on. But there's, there's this region between the uh, event horizon and the entanglement horizon that can sort of maintain the information of what went into a black hole. And when things are getting radiated out of a black hole, it's believed that at the end of the life of a black hole, eventually everything is radiated out. And the thing has a big explosion as it gets faster and faster as the black hole gets smaller and smaller and poof, eventually there's no black hole anymore. Um, and that's as a result of quantum effects. But in our kind of model, that happens because there is the, the information that went into the black hole is trapped between these two kinds of horizons. Um, and uh, so it can kind of uh, happily come out again when the, when the black hole evaporates. That entanglement horizon is a strange quantum phenomenon that uh, comes out of our models. And it's a place where uh, it's a little bit of a strange thing. It's something where if you were uh, an observer, if you were hanging out near this entanglement horizon, what would happen is that uh, in quantum mechanics, one of the issues is that quantum mechanics says many different possible things can happen. But we have the idea that we can, eventually we decide, we measure a particular outcome. But that process of measuring an outcome takes a certain amount of time. And at this entanglement horizon, the amount of time it will take to measure an outcome from a quantum measurement goes to infinity. And that means that we can sort of never decide, we can never make the measurement, we can never definitively decide, did the particle go into the black hole or not? And that's, that's kind of how that works. Uh, let's see. Gosh. Um, uh, well, let's see, all kinds of questions here. All right, we got a question um, from Thoth asking about, is it possible to clone a dinosaur? Um, and how might that work? Okay, first of all, uh, what would it mean to clone a dinosaur? Well, all life on Earth is specified by DNA. Sometimes it's a virus, just RNA. But DNA, this molecule that is basically uh, gives a program for how to construct, for example, us. So like I have a copy of my genome, the, uh, the sequence of, of pieces of DNA molecules that exist in all the cells in my body. It's about 6 billion base pairs long. Base pairs are these A, G, C, T uh, groups of, of atoms that exist on this long strand of DNA, um, which is, is the thing that encodes that information. So what happens is this DNA, this program, for humans, six billion base pairs long. This program basically says how to make the molecules that we're made of, the proteins and things that we're made of. It says uh, each gene, and there are about 30,000 genes in humans, um, where each gene is a certain uh, piece of that long six billion base pair sequence in our DNA. And it says some genes are bigger than others, like there might be one that's uh, one megabase long, one million bases long, and that, or there might be one that's only a kilobase long or even shorter than that. Um, but these genes are basically specifying, okay, make a protein that has units A, G, C, T, 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 G, A, C, T, T, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that protein is made, the protein is made in with the amino acids, the, the about 20 amino acids that are sort of the building blocks of proteins, and those 
those base pairs specify the sequence of amino acids that will be put together to make each kind of protein. And so we have many kinds of proteins, you know, actin in our muscles, uh, um, cytochrome, um, uh, ATP, I mean, lots of different things that do different, have different functions. Um, the, uh, the, um, uh, so, so what our DNA is doing is specifying, make these particular proteins. And then these particular proteins are, uh, when we grow, those are the proteins that are being produced to, uh, to make all the different things we have, the, you know, skin, bones, uh, eyes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So our particular, um, uh, so that's the, the program that sort of specifies how to make us. So when we talk about cloning things, what we're talking about is taking that program and using it to uh, build a, a new organism. So if, if you were saying, you know, let's clone this cat, for example, you would take the DNA from your cat and you would uh, just take a complete copy of that DNA and you would say, let's make a new cat based on the program for that particular cat. Now, the other thing to say is between different humans, there's always a variation in our base pairs. There's millions of, uh, out of the 6 billion base pairs, there's many millions of base pairs that differ between humans. And we typical, we all have about 700,000 base pairs that are pretty much unique to us, us as particular humans. Because when, when our DNA was originally uh, produced, the um, when when uh, uh, you know when when each new organism is is conceived, the the DNA, the process of making that DNA um, has a certain number of of uh, random mutations in it, um, and uh, uh, that um, and we also get uh, half the DNA from our mother, half from our father, and so on. But there's also random mutations that happen even beyond the mixing from parents. Um, so we each end up with a, a certain amount of completely unique DNA that nobody else will have exactly like that. Okay, but between if between all humans, most of our six billion base pairs are exactly the same. If we look at a dog, for example, its six billion base pairs will have all kinds of differences from ours. Now, it's actually a little bit embarrassing that I don't know what fraction it is for a dog, but it's, it's quite possible 90, 95% of the DNA, maybe, maybe a little less than that, um, is shared between us and dogs. There's a lot of basic functions of living organisms that are very much shared and have been pretty much the same in the history of life on earth for a billion, two billion years. Uh, some of the basic things about how living organisms work are really the same across many different organisms. But okay, so let's say we want to make a dinosaur. Well, what we would have to do is get the program for making a dinosaur. We'd have to get the DNA of the dinosaur. How would we get the DNA of the dinosaur? Well, DNA is actually a pretty robust molecule, and it is conceivable that DNA could be maintained in uh, uh, not decay over the 65 billion years since dinosaurs disappeared, um, and not um, and that we might. So there was a kind of an idea that that wound up in in the Jurassic Park movie, I think. That was that maybe a mosquito would bite a dinosaur, suck the blood of the dinosaur, then the mosquito would get frozen in amber, uh, type of type of rock, and it would be stuck in amber. And but that molecule, the molecules from the blood of the dinosaur containing the dinosaur's DNA, will be in the mosquito that had been sort of uh, embedded in this lump of amber, and we'd be able to break the thing open, take out that molecule, and it's like hello, here we have a, a molecule, a DNA program from a dinosaur. Okay, that's one possibility. There's another possibility, which is just look at all the different organisms that have evolved in the history of life on Earth. Dinosaurs, pretty much what were dinosaurs became birds in the history of life on Earth, or so it seems. So the things, you know, gradually there's evolution. Uh, the, one organism will gradually uh, give rise to another organism as sort of this moment when a separate species breaks off. Um, it's kind of like an event horizon forming in the physics of black holes or something. They're there for a while, everybody can interact and everybody can interbreed. And then, then there's this kind of separation that happens as uh, some members of a species become, the, as, as you get a separate species, the things become different enough to break off um, and not be able to breed together anymore. But anyway, so if we look at the history of life on Earth, there's this big complicated tree of life where all these different species, all these different organisms came into existence. 
One thing we can do is say, okay, let's look at everything that was the successor of the dinosaurs. And let's try and figure out from all these different things that came out from the dinosaurs, can we work backwards to figure out what the DNA of the dinosaurs must have been, given that they led to this kind of bird over here, this kind of reptile over here, this kind of thing over here. You know, let's pick, put all those pieces together and see what the common ancestor that was the dinosaur must have been. But okay. So let's imagine that we've successfully got, and we've got a decent idea these days about what some aspects of, of dinosaur DNA must have been like. And over time, we'll probably get more ideas about that um, as we are able to sequence more organisms, as we're able to, you know, maybe we'll find that magic mosquito, I don't know, but um, at least we'll be able to do this sort of backward inference of what dinosaur DNA must have been like. Okay, so let's say we've got the program for a dinosaur. How do we actually make a dinosaur? Well, it's a little tricky because let's say you're cloning a cat, for example, and, and people have done that. I think there's a, there's, a, there's a certain tendency to call that a copycat, so to speak. Um, the, uh, um, but in any case, you, you basically, you take, well, the, the first kind of organism that was cloned, uh, a mammal that was cloned was a uh, sheep called Dolly. Um, and uh, Dolly the sheep was, uh, this was in um, the 1990s, um, it's an interesting thing that for many, many years before that time, people had said cloning a mammal is impossible. And I, I used to ask, why is it impossible? Explain to me why it's impossible. People would always say, oh, it's just too difficult. There are all these things that can go wrong, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The final procedure for cloning a mammal was really weird. I mean, it involves basically electric shocks to, to cells and things like this. It's kind of like in the Frankenstein uh, you know, story or something. But in any case, it was, there was a procedure found for cloning even mammals uh, and probably worked for humans too, although people don't want to try that. Um, the, uh, uh, the sort of more junior versions of that with, with making uh, human organs and things that are, that are more interesting. But um, uh, the, the, thing that, um, uh, the thing that you do then is you, you have the program for Dolly the sheep and you want to actually make a sheep from it. Well, the good news is we have other sheep. So we can take that uh, DNA that we have from Dolly the sheep, and we can make that into the, the fertilized egg um, that will be injected into a, you know, this is in vitro fertilization for a sheep, so to speak. Um, you're putting the, uh, the DNA from Dolly into the, the fertilized egg uh, that is going to grow into another sheep and you inject that into a sheep and it grows inside the sheep. And then you get uh, a young Dolly the sheep um, from, from the, you know, you had an original sheep and then you were gonna make an exact copy of that sheep by taking DNA out of the first sheep and putting it into sort of in vitro fertilization of another sheep and then getting the result out. Okay, so notice there is an important piece to this, which is you, you have a, a fertilized, you know, sheep egg and into that, you put this particular DNA that made Dolly the sheep, but you have this fertilized sheep egg. So one of the problems is for a dinosaur, we don't have a dinosaur. You know, if we're trying to make a stegosaurus, we might, um, well, uh, we might say, well, what's, the, what's all the rat stegosauruses, because they're reptiles, had actual external eggs. They had eggs that sat on the ground and eventually hatched with little stegosauruses coming out. Um, and uh, so, you know, what about the rest of the Stegosaurus egg? You know, do we have the wherewithal to make the rest of the Stegosaurus egg? Can we make, um, uh, and, and, um, and that's a more challenging thing. We might be able to deduce backwards what the DNA of the Stegosaurus was like, but do we have the egg? So what people have tried to start thinking about is could we take, for example, a chicken, which is a bird, and um, could we take kind of a chicken egg and could we somehow put our guess about what dinosaur DNA must be like and somehow put it into a chicken egg and, and maybe the chicken is sort of similar enough to a dinosaur that the baby stegosaurus can happily grow inside a chicken egg as it could grow inside a stegosaurus egg. And if that worked, then eventually we'd have hatching stegosauruses um, and then we would have uh, uh, successfully cloned dinosaurs. Uh, do I think this will eventually happen? Yes, I do. Uh, we will definitely eventually have cloned dinosaurs. Um, and they will be, uh, uh, you know, it's an interesting question how, um, uh, you know, what uh, good or bad things will happen as a result of doing that. Um, but yes, I think there will eventually be cloned dinosaurs. And, and yes, you will probably, whether you'll be able to 
go to a pet store and buy a, uh, you know, I don't think a stegosaurus would be a great pet to have. They got, they got really big, um, but there were little dinosaurs too. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I think um, the obstinate stegosaurus pet would be a bad thing to have. Uh, a uh, friend of mine has studied a lot the dinosaur motion of dinosaur tails, and he's pretty sure that some dinosaurs could whip their tails around at supersonic speeds. So you don't want to be near a, a dinosaur that isn't happy about what's going on. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, that, that's um, so. Yeah, I think that's a um, that's something to look forward to in the future. Um, oh my gosh, so many questions. Um, there was a question here from Icy about how do we tell, I'm not sure if this is a good one to really cover, but um, there's a question here about how do we tell the difference between science and pseudoscience? Uh, you know, people call things pseudoscience when they believe that they're nonsense. Um, Sometimes things that seemed like they were pseudoscience turn out to actually be science and actually be true. And sometimes things that people thought were pseudoscience turn out to be, as people expected, nonsense. And it's, uh, it's often quite challenging to tell the difference because somebody can have an unlikely theory for something, but it can turn out to be true. And it was just unlikely because everybody was off thinking something completely different was true. Um, so, you know, there are, so, there, uh, there are particular areas where people uh, will say, oh, that's pseudoscience. So I'll give you one example. It's not so popular in, the, in modern times, but it's popular in the past, is um, things like extrasensory perception and telepathy and so on. So what's that about? So, you know, we communicate by talking to each other. We say something, somebody else hears it. We can communicate by gesturing around and people can see what we gestured. But there was an idea at one point that it was popular in the, in, in up until oh, probably 20, 30 years ago, that there might also be direct brain to brain communication. That it might be the case that the something associated with the thoughts that we were thinking would be transmittable to another brain directly without us talking, without anything else. Maybe it's some electrical process, maybe it's something, it's not clear what it is. So, so that was a that was a thing, and people studied it, and the people did all kinds of all kinds of things where they would have one person in a room who was looking at cards, and they would have another person outside the room who was trying to think very hard and try and imagine what card the other person was seeing by by virtue of this kind of extrasensory perception, this telepathy, and so on. And there was a lot of study of that and how that worked, and you know, was it were people guessing the cards more often than you would expect by chance, and so on. And in the end, that looked like pseudoscience because there was no sort of significant effect that was found. But if we ask the question, could there be brain-to-brain -brain communication? Could it be the case that the electrical uh, signals that are produced by our brains are somehow detected by another brain? Is that absolutely physically impossible? No, it's not impossible. Um, I mean, you know, after all, we can perfectly well, if, if we measure our brain waves, we put an electrical sensor on our heads and we measure brain waves, well, we can, you know, there's a thing outside of our brains that is sort of extrasensorially uh, detecting what's going on inside our brains. It's a big jumbled mess right now. We can't really tell. There's no good way to say, oh, let's put an electrical uh, detector on our brain and say, okay, I'm now thinking about a dinosaur type thing. We can't read out the information yet about what our brains are thinking, although I suspect eventually we'll be able to do much better at that. Although one thing to realize is that what's happening inside our brains is probably really different for each person. You know, in human language, uh, the way human language works is that we're all saying the same word to kind of mean the same thing. Language is this kind of social thing where everybody has to agree that the word uh, camera means the same kind of thing. But what's going on inside our brains, there's no reason for the kind of way that I represent knowledge inside my brain to have anything to do with the way that somebody else represents knowledge inside their brain. There's nothing that is causing us to communicate directly the internal representation in terms of electrical signals and so on of knowledge from brain to brain. But is it possible that there could be some sort of brain to brain communication? Sure, it's possible. Um, 
Is it, uh, uh, and you know, when we look at computers, again, if we looked at, you know, if you, if you take a radio and you put it an old fashioned, like AM radio or something, you put it near a computer. And I haven't done this for a few years. So I don't actually know what happens anymore, but it used to be the case that you would hear on the radio detect, you'd be able to detect the kind of the thought processes going on in the computer. You'd hear nasty sound, weird sounds. And as the computer does different things, uh, you'd hear different uh, different signals. And you know, you can you can often tell if you if you make your computer do a lot more work, you'll hear the fan come on because the computer will be using more power and its fan will automatically try and cool it down and things like this. You can you can there are similarly electrical signals that differ depending on what the, what the computer is doing, just as presumably there are things in our brains that, that differ. We certainly know that there are things in our brains that differ when you go to sleep, things like that. We have different uh, brain waves and so on. So, you know, so that's an example. So telepathy, extrasensory perception is an example of something that is today firmly in the bin of pseudoscience. Will it turn out that it's a real thing? Will it turn out that you know ants really have that as well as being able to lay down chemical trails for each other? Will they, in fact, will it be discovered that you know the brain of an ant can communicate directly with the brain of another ant? It's possible. Right now, people would say that's pseudoscience. Whether it will stay pseudoscience, I don't know. Sometimes there are things that are in, in science, so to speak, that turn out to be total nonsense um, and that people have believed for a long time. I mean, there are a lot of things around um, uh, this pandemic where we're, we're getting uh, you know, more aware of a lot of things in immunology, but people had said it never works that way, but actually it does. And we're discovering that it actually works that way. And so on. So there are a lot of things where people would have said, "Oh no, no, that's a that's a kind of pseudoscience theory," but actually, it turns out it's not. So there's a it's a it's a bit of a more complicated uh, you know interchange between sort of science and pseudoscience than one might think. And sometimes things can be believed as science for 50 years, 100 years, and it just turns out to be nonsense. I mean, you know, it was believed for a long time that you know the shape of one's head was an important determiner of one's personality. I don't think people believe that anymore. But there were all kinds of scientific studies that showed that, and uh, you know, it turns out to be nonsense, um, uh, or to a large extent, nonsense. And just like there are other things where people believed that you know the germ theory of disease, the fact that there was some invisible vector that was causing disease to happen. That seemed like pseudoscience. That seemed like nonsense for a long time until it turned out to be true. So it can be a complicated thing to tell the difference between science and pseudoscience. I, I would like to say that after all the years of experience that I've had in, in doing science and in trying to tell the difference, I, I do better than the average probably in that. Um, I'm trying to think of an example where I've been wrong um, about uh, how things would come out there. Um, yeah, there have been cases where I where I thought the theory was a little bit crazy, but it turned out to be right. I wasn't sure the theory was wrong, but it seemed more complicated than I would have expected to be to be the kind of theory that would turn out to be right. And it turned out it was right. All right, let's see. Gosh, so many questions here and I'm running out of time. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Oh. Oh, there's, a, there's a question here, it's a, quite a simple one. In convection, what drives the flow of air and fluid in the first place? What drives it is simply that hot fluid is lower density than cold fluid, so it floats on top of the cold fluid. So it, it's, it's it pulled up by, by, the, um, uh, by the cold fluid. And, and convection starts up when fluid is heated on a surface and then, then starts rising. Um, let's see. Um, all right, there are questions here about um, a few quite fairly simple ones. Is there any possibility for the creation of dark matter in a fusion reactor like a tokamak? Um, we don't know for sure, but I'm guessing the answer is no. And why do I say the answer is no? If dark matter was going to be produced, you would see processes go on. So dark matter has mass. It has momentum, it has energy. 
So what you would see is you'd see particles coming together and they would, uh, particles come together, they have a certain amount of energy and particles go out and then there'd be missing energy. There'd be something where you don't see what comes out, but you know it has energy because total energy is conserved. The energy coming in is equal to the energy going out, but you only see some of the energy coming out. It'd be like a miniature version of what we see in galaxies when we see sort of the presence of dark matter, although that's more gravitational effects. This would be the fact that there's energy that is disappearing and it sort of seems dark. Now, historically, this kind of happened before because there were uh, nuclear decay processes, nuclear beta decay, where we precisely saw things like, um, uh, you know, a, a, another nucleus would be produced, an electron would be produced, and it'd be whizzing off in some direction. And it's like, how is momentum conserved in this case? We've got this electron whizzing off in this direction, and there's nothing compensating for it, sort of going the other way. Well, that's what led to the invention of neutrinos, the, the realization that there was another kind of particle. It was just something we couldn't see. It seemed like kind of a dark matter kind of thing. I, it's a particle that has no charge. It doesn't interact electrically. It has only uh, so-called weak nuclear interactions. Um, and neutrinos are, are very weakly interacting things. They can often go all the way through the earth, for example. Um, and so that's an example of, of, of something like a, a, a sort of previous version of something like dark matter that um, uh, existed, uh, that, that exists in the universe. And so people have certainly looked for dark matter where it's like a, some process happens with particles colliding and they have a certain amount of energy and whoops, we missed the energy. People have looked for that and they haven't seen that. So that's, a, that's evidence that doesn't happen often at least. So I, I think that probably is not a process that can make um, dark matter, but um, I, I, you know, it's an interesting question and maybe it can make it as small, um, uh, at a small rate. All right, I am supposed to go to something completely different now, but um, I am just, this is so much fun. I'm, I'm um, uh, oh gosh, there's so many questions I want to, uh, want to answer here. So there's one from William here. Why is the moon the same size as the sun when seen from the earth? That is really a coincidence. Uh, eventually it will be smaller. The moon is gradually moving away from the earth and eventually it will uh, not be, you know, right now you hold out your thumb, I don't know whether this is, uh, and you can more or less cover both the moon and the sun uh, with, the, with the angle that you get to. Um, you know, in, in um, uh, I think in Babylonian times, they used to measure angles on the sky by such and such a number of fingers. Um, you know, when you hold your hand out at a certain at the sort of, uh, your fingers are a certain size, there's a certain angle there. But, but in any case, so right now, for we are the unique planet in our solar system where the, um, actually, I don't know this for absolutely certain, I think we're the unique planet where a moon of ours, and we only have one moon, uh, just exactly covers the size of the, of the disk of the sun, which is why when you see a total solar eclipse, I've seen two in my life. They're really cool, worth going to see them. Um, the, you know, the, 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 the moon, when it moves in front of the sun, just exactly covers the, the sun. They, they more or less exactly match in size. Um, if we're on Mars, for example, the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, are tiny compared to the disk of the sun on Mars. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, so in, in time, so be, be, be glad you live at this time in history. You know, in another, uh, in another, probably even another 50 million years, 100 million years, uh, you won't be able to see nice total solar eclipses on the earth that, that same way because the moon will move too far away. But I think it's sort of a coincidence of current times that that's what we see. Uh, all right. Well, I'm so... Um, Oh boy, there's a question here. This one's easy to answer. Uh, the question, what do you do for fun for me? This is a good example of what I do for fun. This is fun for me. Uh, it's, uh, um, uh, what else do I do for fun? I, I do science for fun. Um, I, uh, I do, I'm a tech CEO for fun. I kind of like to, do the things that I like to do, so to speak. And I've kind of tried to arrange things so I get to spend as much of my time doing things I like as, as possible. Um, and uh, uh, usually I, at times I develop various kinds of hobbies 
And somehow, almost every hobby I've ever developed has eventually turned into a real thing. So I kind of had hobbies of studying history, and I've written some 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 books about kind of um, uh, you know a book of like a book of historical biography and things like that. And I you know that ends up becoming a thing that I do. Um, I don't know what's going to happen to this particular hobby, hobby that has been uh, sort of uh, originally. I I started doing these um, Q and A's uh, because I wanted to uh, 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 help out in in the pandemic, but. They're really fun, and um, this is what I, an example of the kind of thing I do for fun. And um, I'd better go and um, uh, do some day job tech CEOing because that's the next thing that's up on my agenda. Actually, talking about um, uh, um, an initiative that um, we are going to be pursuing as the pandemic continues uh, in education, and maybe I'll talk about that another time. All right. Well, thanks very much. Uh, see you again next week. And um, I'll try and uh, cover some of the questions that came in here and I didn't get a chance to, to go through next week. So please tune in again. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye.